I'm Michael Ignatieff, Rector and President of Central European University, and this is a presidential lecture uh, with the very distinguished economist uh, Robert Skidelsky. Um, this is lecture is going to be recorded. <clears throat> um, it's an event in which we welcome your participation and questions. And um, so I hope that uh, Professor Skidelsky will talk for about 45 minutes. Um, and then we will go to questions. If you want to ask questions, you should use the chat function. And then I will look in the chat window and uh, read them out. I think that's the most efficient way to do it, given the number of people who've um, tuned in for this event. <clears throat> uh, just a brief word about um, Robert Skidelsky. Um, he is an emeritus professor of economics. He is the biographer of Keynes. It's an acclaimed biographer. And since I'm a biographer myself, it, it's one of the great biographies. Um, of John Maynard Keynes, the quite possibly the most influential economist of the 20th century. Robert Skidelsky is also a member of the British House of Lords, and so he's Lord Skidelsky to you and to me. Uh, he is also a frequent uh, fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences, our fellow neighbor, neighborly institution across the way in Vienna and will be and is a frequent visitor to Vienna and we hope to see him in the flesh right soon, but because of COVID we're doing this uh, lecture uh, online. Um, his topic is Economists and Capitalist Crisis, Different Perspectives and Cultural Relevance, Current Relevance, um, <clears throat> an attempt to look at all the ways back to Marx in which economists have theorized the tendency of capitalist systems to lurch into various kinds of crisis. This tendency to lurch into crisis is a very serious challenge to the equilibrium models of classical economic theory. And that is Robert Skidelsky's subject. And so I'd like to welcome Robert, um, who's uh, speaking to us from Britain and ask him to begin his lecture. Thanks so much. Michael Ignatieff, ladies and gentlemen, it's very good to, um, I'm very glad to have been asked to give this lecture, though of course very disappointed at not being able to deliver it in person or to be indeed in Vienna um, um, at this time. All human communities, indeed all living things are subject to shocks which undermine or destroy their means of survival but until modern times, these have usually been natural shocks like earthquake, plague, and drought. Many disasters we label natural, of course, weren't completely natural since human activity contributed to them. And the big current example is indeed the COVID-19 pandemic. Nevertheless, we still think of them as sufficiently remote from anything we have done to be called visitations of nature. However, human communities have also experienced disruptions which arise directly out of their own activities and without any natural comorbidity, strictly speaking, endogenous shocks rather than exogenous shocks. Their source lies in the way we organize our societies. War and its consequences are the main examples. War is in fact, a de decreasing feature of modern life, we have evolved a much milder form of warfare called economic competition. But of course, it also has its casualties, not millions of people killed, but millions of lives blighted by unemployment and other social diseases. These shocks are associated with one particular form of economic organization, capitalism. They're generated by the capitalist system itself, not by its encounter with any external objects. The crises of capitalism have sometimes been so severe that they've encouraged revolutionary hopes of a final crisis, as we shall see. 
But capitalism has shown remarkable powers of reinventing itself. So the form capitalist crisis takes is one of alternating waves of booms and slumps. Economists have identified long cycles and short cycles, but their causes aren't very well understood and none of them have so far proved fatal to the system. The, the one crisis that did prove fatal to the system for a time was of course the First World War, which wasn't really a crisis of capitalism. In this lecture, I want to consider the four main explanations given for these non-linear phenomena, each of which takes its name from a famous economist, Marxist, Schumpeterian, Hayekian, and Keynesian, and ask which explanation or combination of explanations throw light on what is happening today. Rather cheekily, I'll slice through their rich intellectual legacies to a single point, which is their account of capitalist crisis. A preliminary classification may help clear the air. Gottfried Haberler, in his book, Prosperity and Depression, distinguishes between two main types of explanation of the boom slump boom phenomenon, real and monetary. The first focuses on a disturbance to the production system. The second on some malfunction of the monetary system. Rather as an afterthought, Harbler added an approach which he called psychological and which might be called the state of confidence in which business activity alternates between errors of optimism and errors of pessimism. Most modern business cycle theories combine elements of all three. Their chief difference lies in their identification of the trigger cause. In the case of real theories, the typical trigger is an invention or a cluster of inventions. In the case of monetary theories, the trigger is the misbehavior of money. In psychological theories, there's no specific trigger in the sense that we can identify one event which leads to another. The trigger is a shift in expectations which may arise from any cause. However, whatever the trigger, the cycle may be amplified by other factors. Typically a boom triggered off by a real event may be amplified by the actions of the banking system, causing greater crisis and eventual crash. This doesn't exhaust the richness of cycle theory. Economic historians have identified Kondratiev cycles, Yugla cycles, Kitchen cycles, all of different durations. So there's no single monocausal um, uh, explanation um, of a cycle. But the different theories do share the common aim of trying to explain the rhythmic character uh, of, of economic activity in a capitalist system. They thus come up against the equilibrium method of mainstream e economics and have therefore actually never made it into mainstream theory. You can do an economics course and never encounter a business cycle. There are no business cycle theories of socialist economics, uh, socialist economies, because there are strictly speaking no businessmen in socialist economies. The Soviet economy experienced only one endogenous shock, its collapse. Well, let's start with Karl Marx. Um, two planks of Marx's economics the labor theory of value and the class determination of incomes, both of which he got from Ricardo, have been expelled from economics. But this leaves Marx's ethics and sociology un undisturbed. The labor theory of value, though it fails to explain prices, is a good formulation of the moral case against capitalism. And the theory of class determined income shares while it fell 
victim to the marginal productivity theory of wages, continues to illuminate the political and social structure of the capitalist system, and particularly its power structure. In the Marxist theory, what causes crisis is the exploitation of the worker by the capitalist. This is a moral offense, which has economic consequences because it pinpoints a contradiction between the modes of production and the relations of production. Here's Marx's definition of capitalism. It is the purchase by monetary capital of free labor power that in turn produces more value than is given to it in wages. Exploitation, that is, arises from the difference between a what, what a worker produces for the capitalist and the pay he receives from that capitalist. And Marx goes on to say that because they control the capital stock, capital, capitalists can extract more hours work from the worker than they pay him. And Marx calls this difference surplus value. Surplus value is the source of the capitalist income, profit, interest, and rent. And I quote, the income of the ruling class can always be reduced in the final analysis to the product of unpaid labor. But of course, this situation is unstable. Um, capitalism is in, impelled by the logic of competition to turn the main part of the loot wrung from unpaid labor into capital. Constantly, that is to revolutionize the means of production by replacing humans by machines. But every new machine reduces the surplus value the capitalist gets from production, since you can't exploit a machine. So the higher the capital labor ratio, the less surplus value there is to extract. Capitalism fulfills its historic task of accumulating capital, but at the cost of its own destruction, like those species which die at the moment they give birth to a new life. The economic contradictions of capitalism take two forms, a crisis of profitability and a crisis of realization. The crisis of profitability is started off always the event, what's the trigger? An investment boom. A labor shortage develops in relation to the expansion of capital goods, forcing up real wages. And in Marx's language, that, that means the ratio of constant capital to variable capital rises. Labor's income share goes up, the capitalist's income share goes down. And so you get a crisis of profitability, a collapse in profitability. This leads to the liquidation of part of the capital stock and the appearance of that well-known character in Marx's stage army, the reserve army of the unemployed. The, incidentally, this reserve army of the unemployed is Marx's substitute for Malthus's redundant population. Wages fall back to subsistence, the rate of exploitation picks up, and the next stage of accumulation proceeds with the same results. As capital accumulates, it becomes more concentrated, the pressure on surplus value grows, the crises become deeper, the immis immiseration of the population increases. The general law of capitalist accumulation, says Marx, is that it pauperizes a greater and greater fraction of the population. And this goes on till the final crisis of capitalism. Technically, this comes about when the rate of profit falls to zero, but the immiserated workers overthrow the system before this and uh, before this end point is reached. Well, that's the vision, uh, but he's got a second, a second uh, plank of crisis, if you like, where the trigger isn't the crisis of profitability, but the crisis of immiseration, realization. Exploitation, you see, leaves workers unable to buy all they produce. The last cause of all real crises, wrote Marx, 
always remains the poverty and restricted consumption of the masses as compared to the tendency of capitalist production to develop the productive forces. The importance of this second crisis is that it eliminates the possibility of restoring equilibrium through a decline in the rate of accumulation, that is, through an increase in the rate of consumption. So that's ruled out by growing immiseration. Well, volume one ends with a magnific magnificent rhetorical flourish, which I'm sure many of you uh, are familiar with centralization of the means of production and socialization of labor at last reach a point when they become incompatible with their capitalist integument. This integument is burst asunder. The knell of capitalist private property sounds. The expropriators are expropriated. Well, it didn't quite happen, did it? Marx never really was able to clinch his argument. He was a fine economist. He was a great sociologist. He was a great thinker, one of the great thinkers of modern times. Um, but he couldn't clinch that argument about the final crisis, either on its active side in the revolt uh, of the proletariat or in its uh, uh, mechanical side, the, rate, the fall in the rate of profit to zero. Um, because it really depended, his, 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 his ap apocalyptic vision really depended on the growing uh, poverty of the workforce. He failed to see that labor would gain from the machine age and that capital would gain from concentration. So his theory of the end of cycles, the end of capitalism is reduced to a theory of deep business cycles. But there's an interesting development of Marxist theory uh, in the hands of one of his disciples, Rosa Luxemburg. That is, the crisis of realization, as Marx called it, becomes an autonomous underconsumptionist or oversaving theory of the business cycle, akin to that developed by the liberal theorist um, J.A. Hobson. And this is what Hobson writes. Saving, while it increases the existing aggregate of capital, simultaneously reduces consumption. Any undue exercise of this habit of saving, therefore, must therefore cause an accumulation of capital in excess of what is required for use, and this excess will exist in the form of general overproduction. Depressions are a way of eliminating the excess capital accumulated in the boom. Um, uh, restoring the correct saving income ratio. So that's the underconsumptionist theory, and it's been very influential. It was influential as an explanation of the New Deal. And it has its place in thinking about what's going wrong today when we talk about the growth and the inequality of uh, wealth and income. Uh, and, it, and, and therefore, Mar Marx is the real originator of the question, a deep question whether the greater equality which all reformers of capitalism want is compatible with the continuation of the system. Well, now um, Schumpeter. Can we come to Schumpeter? I love Schumpeter. <laughs> uh, he um, he uh, roots the business cycle in real rather than monetary events though, like for Marx, money is a complicating and, and expanding, amplifying factor. Capitalism, wrote Schumpeter in his big book, Business Cycles, is a form of, or method of economic change and not only never is, but never can be stationary. Capitalism can't be stationary. The theory of equilibrium is just the wrong theory to describe this dynamic system. His two big thoughts, very familiar to you, I'm sure, is that innovation is capitalist's engine and entrepreneurs are agents of innovation. Schumpeter was an intellectual entrepreneur himself. He is reported to have said he had three goals in life, to be the world's greatest lover, greatest horseman and greatest economist and only the decline of the cavalry had thwarted the achievement of all three. He's best known for his theory of creative destruction. 
the view that the capitalist system progresses by constantly revolutionizing the economic structure. New firms, new products, new technologies continually replace old ones. Since innovation comes in fits and starts, the capitalist economy is naturally and healthfully subject to cycles of boom and bust. <clears throat> the agent of this revolutionary process is the heroic individual, the individual heroic entrepreneur, the individual owner in the 19th century, replaced by big business in the 20th century. Innovation needs its reward, and hence a dynamic economy is one which allows the innovator huge profits. So it's an unequal economy. Temporary monopoly is, of course, is nature's way of allowing innovation, innovators to gain from their innovations. Competition eventually liquidates monopoly profits, but you've got always to have some short run inequity of prices uh, and, and rewards, inequity of rewards as the price for long run progress. So his account, his account starts from the econo economists general full employment equilibrium. That's the starting point of his analysis. And it's marked by a circular flow of goods and money into established channels. To innovate, the entrepreneur has, must divert labor and capital from the circular flow to new uses. And this disruption of the circular flow by the entrepreneur explains instability. What Schumpeter called perennial gales of creative destruction perpetually draw economic life away from equilibrium. Um, um, uh, by reason of the pioneering activities of daring innovators, whose lightning successes entice a swarm of imitations into a wild outpouring of new investment activity. <clears throat> As a result, the history of capitalism is studied with violent bursts and catastrophes, he writes. In a phrase reminiscent of Marx, Schumpeter writes that capitalism incessantly revolutionizes the economic structure from within, endogenously, incessantly destroying the old ones, incessantly creating new ones. However, unlike Marx, he sees no tragedy in this process. The Great Depression was a good cold douche, he told his students at Harvard in 1938. Along with Schumpeter's positive con contribution to economics went a persisting critique of conventional e economics, whose concern with static problems of allocation in perfectly competitive markets rules out change and the role of the entrepreneur. But Schumpeter's speculation raised far beyond this into the question of the durability of a civilization which lives by continually destroying what it has created. A line of thought which went back to Marx in his Communist Manifesto and in his book, um, Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy, Schumpeter says that really the, bourgeois, the bourgeoisie creates its own grave by constantly creating anti-capitalist intellectual class. So that's the way the bourgeoisie digs its own grave. Um, and it may well be that Schumpeter has more to tell us about the nature of capitalism and the nature of, I would say, bourgeois civilization in general than the new breed of market idealists, um, which globalization has spawned. But again, Schumpeter's theory of cycles is incomplete because this is why technical innovation is a microeconomic disturbance. Schumpeter never made it clear how local plan failures disrupted by innovation grow sufficiently large to generate general recessions. In the language of economics, what were the dynamics which turned price adjustment, however messy, into quantity adjustment, that is into the decline of output, general decline of output. And this is where Schumpeter meets Keynes. 
But first, Hayek, far from a diversion, because he's also a central part, <coughs> central uh, actor in this story. Hayek is in the line of economic theorists going back to David Hume uh, and including Vixel and Friedman, for whom the business cycle originates in a monetary disturbance. And Hayek calls money the loose joint in the economic system. Hume, 18th century uh, David Hume, recognized that in the short run, an influx of gold uh, could, by creating money illusion, stimulate business activity beyond its natural limits by inducing people to trade at the wrong prices. In other words, it raised prices, the influx of gold, and therefore entrepreneurs thought that their, their profits would go up in, in the future. But this was wrong. It was money illusion. And so you get this idea running through the monetary theorists of money being a Pandora uh, a, a Pandora-like deceiver, um, which obscured accurate knowledge of barter values. And that became a real trope in classical economics. Hayek's theory of crisis starts from the notion of a self-adjusting equilibrium of markets for both present and future goods with the rate of interest as the price which adjusts decisions to save, that is decisions to um, invest in the future, um, with um, decisions um, to uh, invest. Changes in the structure of production, the pr structure of production gets more elongated in Hayekian language as the quantity of capital goods to consumption goods grows. Um, th that, that will take place Normally, it will reflect inter-temporal inter prefer preferences of, of, of consumers, provided one condition is met, that money stays neutral, that money is neutral. That is, in the absence of inflation or deflation. The crisis which produces a slump is a crisis of overinvestment in relation to the amount of consumption people want to give up, financed by credit expansion by the banking system. Quite simply, the banks make too much credit available. Hayek attributed this to the legal sanction um, of fractional reserve banking, which enabled banks to lend more money than the money deposited with them. And the crisis arises from bankers eventually having to raise interest rates as they run out of liquid reserves. The loans are called in, assets forcibly sold, inflated share prices collapse. Where have we been seeing all that happening recently? The slump is merely the process of eliminating the unsustainable investments. Hayek called them malinvestments. And, you know, you can obviously apply Hayek to many recent situations, for example, the collapse of the American property boom in 2007-2008. Hayek would have called them malinvestments, investments that aren't sustainable because they don't reflect the investment of real savings of the public, but of bank credit, and therefore give rise to unsustainable loans. <laughs> Hayek illustrates the process with the following fable. The situation, following an injection of money by the banking system, would be similar to that of a people in an isolated island if, after having partially constructed an enormous machine which was to provide them with all necessities, they found that they'd exhausted all their savings and available free capital before the machine could turn out its product. They would then have no choice but to abandon temporarily the work on the new machine <coughs> and to devote all their labor, uh, all their labor to producing their daily food without any capital. Hayek emphatically rejected the cure of cheap money to enable the machine to go on um, being, being uh, created, because that would only distort the structure of production even further, amplifying the eventual collapse. Hayek would have hated quantitative easing. His ideal solution was to forbid banks to create credit. 
That is to abolish fractional reserve banking and force banks to hold 100% deposits against their loans. But in an ideal, in an, in, an, in, a, in an imperfect world, the best that you could do was to adhere to the gold standard, to have all bank credit backed by gold. Um, and um, the gold standard was, was what he advocated all his life until the hope of restoring it um, dr drove him to even more radical, more radical remedy of, 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 of creating a, a competitive uh, uh, central banking system um, and abolishing central banking altogether as we know it. Now I come to the last of my um, business cycle theorists. I, 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 I bring in Keynes here partly because I know quite a lot about him, but partly because he did actually start life as a, as a business cycle theorist. And, and, and moreover, he started life as a monetary theorist, descri uh, ascribing, um, subscribing just like Hayek did to the quantity theory of money. However, from the start, he deviates uh, from classical business cycle discussions by locating the crisis not in a real event, an invention or a change in the quantity of money, but in a shift in expectations of the future, which are anchored in nothing but expectations themselves. His deviation was therefore epistemological. Its focus was on, on the amount, kind, and reliability of knowledge which economic agents possessed and which businessmen then brought to their decisions. Well, he has two big books. The Treatise on Money in 1930 is a theory of deep cycles. There's no concrete point in its origin. It's simply a shift in market sentiments, and he calls the two opposites of market sentiment, bulls and bears. And this is typical of how he introduces the subject. Something happens to increase the attractions of investment. Something happens. It could be anything. This psychological shift, though, sets in train in, 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 in both his books a mechanical set of events. <clears throat> the banking system starts off by accommodating the greater inducement to invest by increasing the quantity of credit. That's exactly a Hayekian <clears throat> and Schumpeterian argument. The banking system then amplifies the cycle. This causes boom conditions. The point will come, however, and I'm quoting Keynes, when the banking system is no longer able to supply the necessary volume of money to keep the investment boom going consistently with its own principles and traditions. So interest rates go up, leading to the familiar uh, consequences, business losses, falling prices, increased unemployment. So far, so Hayekian, and perhaps not so different from Schumpeter either. But there's a difference in response to this sort of situation. Ha Keynes's difference from Hayek is that whereas they both believe the investment boom is financed by bank credit, Hayek believes that it's bound to collapse and that you, you need to stop the bank credit as soon as possible, whereas Keynes says the question isn't how it was financed, but whether it has created durable assets. Hayek therefore wanted to liquidate the boom and Keynes wanted to keep it going. Shayek, uh, sorry, Schumpeter wanted also to liquidate old investments to make way for new ones. <clears throat> so they both regarded the slump as the cure for the boom. Whereas Keynes said, no, no, the boom should go on. As if it's creating, if it's a genuine investment boom, it's creating assets which will benefit um, the next generation. Um, and therefore you should, you should keep credit going in an investment boom. Um, <clears throat> so there, that was a, an important uh, deviation, even at the point of the treaties on money. But then we come to the general theory. And the difference between Keynes of the treaties and Keynes of the general theory lies not in Keynes's view of how the boom gets going. Again, it's expectations which lead the way, but but in the general theory, there's no recovery. 
there's no recovery mechanism of crash, then gradually the whole thing picks up again. Um, the, instead, the economy settles down to a prolonged and in principle indefinite period of underemployment equilibrium. So in this formulation, Keynes retains the notion of a tendency to equilibrium, but denies that it re represents a tendency to full employment equilibrium. He ceases therefore in strict terms to be a business cycle theorist. The reason there's no automatic recovery is that the two classical price adjustment mechanisms, wage flexibility and the rate of interest don't work in the way the neoclassical economists said they did. Then in the neoclassical theory of, of, of his day placed a huge reliance on wage and price flexibility, especially wage flexibility, and as indeed neoclassical economists do to this day. The neo neoclassical economists said if men are unemployed, they'll accept lower wages. The fall in wages will increase the demand for labor and therefore unemployment will disappear. Straightforward. If, it, if, 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 if there's a stickiness of wages somewhere, it must be due to the unions holding wages up or to governments making it too easy to stay unemployed. And that is the hard line neoclassical view today. Keynes pointed out the fallacy of composition involved in this argument. Wage cuts would, could, would enable one overborrowed employer, one overborrowed industry, or even one overborrowed country um, in international trade to offer more employment. But if all wages are cut, all prices fall, all money incomes fall, the real burden of debt rises and demand is reduced as much as costs. As Joan Robinson put it, in a crowd, anyone can get a better view of the, of the procession if he stands on a chair. But if they all stand up on chairs, no one has a better view. So that's why even if wages are flexible, they don't restore full employment. Further, the neoclassical theory, which both Schumpeter and Marx endorsed, held that a reduced demand for consumer goods meant increased saving. Increased saving meant more money to be lent to industry. So the rate of interest falls, falls um, as the economy, um, as consumption falls. You know, it's a sort of automatic thing. Consumption goes down, saving goes up, rate of interest goes down, the economy starts recovering. But Keynes says this is all fantasy. If incomes are unchanged, a fall in consumption by definition means an increase in saving and a fall in interest rate. But if incomes are going down as the first effect, there will be less saving and therefore no tendency for the rate of interest to fall. This led to Keynes discarding the theory of the rate of interest as the price of saving and putting in its place a totally different theory, um, which is sees the rate of interest as the price of, of money. So two mechanisms hold up the rate of interest. First, you have a fall in savings with income, and secondly, an in increased proportion of the reduced savings is hoarded. So the rate of interest not only doesn't fall, it's quite likely to go up, which is exactly the wrong, wrong response to a fall in aggregate demand. Um, and that's another reason. And of course, to some extent, and that's accepted, that theory of what's called liquidity preference is accepted by central banks now. That's why they respond to the um, to a rise in unemployment and a fall in activity by quantitative easing, expanding credit to force down a rate of interest which would otherwise not fall or would even spike upwards. <clears throat> the, the failure of the classical adjustment mechanism to return um, a shocked uh, economy to full employment became Keynes's main argument for the need for public investment to keep the boom going or lift an economy out of a slump. And it's also the point at which, in the opinion of some economists, Keynes meets Schumpeter, because 
Keynes's theory explains how Schumpeter's micro disturbances can turn into macroeconomic disasters, which Schumpeter himself never managed. Well, <clears throat> let's um, uh, turn to dis a discussion of some of this. <clears throat> Um, having trawled through these explanations of, of, of the way the disruptive forces of capitalism work themselves out, it's easy enough to see why it's proved so difficult to develop a unified theory of the business cycle. Not only are there too many factors or variables which interact with each other, but there's the overriding problem that all the theorists are trying to squeeze the th a theory of endogenous disturbances into an equilibrium framework. Schumpeter described equilibrium as the magna carta of exact economics. Without an equilibrium framework, economics, he says, doesn't exist as an exact science. And that's why scientific economics has clung onto that equilibrium framework so desperately. Remember, economics took its economic model from physics and more remotely from the idea of a natural order this meant that the disturbance had to come from some intrusion into this order from outside, rather like the intrusion of COVID-19 uh, into, into our normal uh, orderly life. And the business cycle theory, although he tries to escape from this uh, cage, is actually trapped in the same equilibrium logic. The growth of wealth is itself a disturbance of a pre-existing equilibrium. For Marx, the disturbing agent was capitalism itself, a kind of Frankenstein's monster, full of contradictions, which was nevertheless the gateway to the final equilibrium, paradise. Yet Marx was defeated by the logic of equilibrium. For all his rhetoric, he could never demonstrate that capitalism produced anything but alternating cycles. Those who accepted the mainstream specification of the capitalist market economy were driven to look for other exogenous uh, agents of disturbance. Solo, Solo's growth model, for example, has technology as the exogenous shock, and that has become um, um, and that became mainstream orthodoxy and has led to such desperate theoretical expedients as the theory of equilibrium business cycle. Um, for Schumpeter, the agent of disturbance, of course, as we've said, is the entrepreneur. And again, it's, it's an intrusion because the entrepreneur is, is a lucky chance in, 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 in the history of heredity. Um, so it, again, he comes from outside. Um, and, and Schumpeter denied that uh, there are equilibrium adjustments available to entrepreneurial shocks. His whole work was about how the economy is in a process of continual dynamic development, but he spent his life trying to construct an equilibrium model which could incorporate the entrepreneur. He failed. For Hayek, the intruders were banks and governments. Money in its natural form of gold, intruder, it's natural, it's, an, it's part of the natural order, an intermediary or lubricant. Banks convert it into an agent of destructive credit creation. Governments abet the intrusion of banks by interfering with market transactions and outcomes. Governments prevent the smooth adjustment uh, by keep holding, up, uh, holding up wages and, and, and subsidizing unemployment. Even Keynes couldn't escape the equilibrium trap. His theory postulated multiple equilibria, but he was unable to explain how underemployment could be an equilibrium phenomenon. Economists' attachment to equilibrium thinking can't be explained just by physics envy. I mean, that, that, they do have that. Uh, in, in large doses, but it's not, it's not by any means the main explanation. Uh, two other considerations play a part. Economics was born in the era of escape from the uh, tyranny, as they saw it, of church and absolute monarchy. It established its scientific credentials by embracing the principle of a natural order. This is the meaning of Adam Smith's invisible hand. If this principle were to be denied, 
the only alternatives it seemed to thinkers of that uh, period were either chaos or some form of external control. So equilibrium theory has functioned as a defense of freedom. The claim being that capitalist market economy is sufficiently orderly not to warrant political control over economic life. And in this defense, cyclical theory has played a part because it emphasizes the market's automatic capacity for self-renewal. Without such a recovery mechanism, the way is opened up for chaos or totalitarianism. This was the danger Hayek discerned in Keynes's teaching. Keynes's recovery mechanism was government and therein lay the slippery slope to totalitarianism, the theme of his uh, road to serfdom. Attached, at, attachment to equilib equilibrium theory has also been driven by faith in progress. In no other way can one understand the indifference of Marx, Schumpeter, or Hayek to the periodic devastations of slumps. In their view, the periodic liquidation of old investments and bouts of unemployment was the price humanity had to pay for its upward ascent. Even Keynes, who sought to mitigate these costs, accepted the argument that progress has a price. And here he is in his Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, written in 1930. But beware, the time for giving up capitalism is not yet. For at least another hundred years, we must pretend to ourselves and to everyone that fair is foul and foul is fair. For foul is useful and fair is not. Avarice and usury and precaution must be our gods for a little longer, for only they can lead us out of the tunnel of economic necessity into the sunlight. So you have to put up with all this. It's obvious, obvious to me reading uh, these people that the, these, uh, that people like Keynes, um, uh, especially Keynes, but also others are producing a secular, secularized version of the Christian creation myth, the fall of man, and then the eventual recovery of paradise. I mean, I think that was Marx uh, very strongly. And here you find that note in Keynes. Well, I end now. I hope you'll see that by a roundabout route, I have uh, brought, brought uh, you to the nub of today's problem. For how much longer is it safe to continue with a foul economic system for the sake of the future benefits it promises? We have come, in the West at least, to doubt those benefits for two reasons. We can no longer believe that further advance in what's called the standard of living will bring us the bliss it promises. And we have come to believe that its pursuit in the form of unrestrained consumerism will bring disaster to humankind by extinguishing its planetary sources of renewal. Paradoxically, this realization requires a search for a different kind of equilibrium, one in which human needs will be in balance with nature. And that means as a first step, a conception of the good life beyond the purely utilitarian calculus of economics. And secondly, restraints on the activities of the business class to bring them in line with the new conception. After 50 years of experience of neoliberalism, the search is on for a sustainable middle way between the extremes of chaos and control. I'm not confident we'll find it, uh, but that's where the search must lie. And I leave you with this question. Does economics as taught and practiced in the economics departments of top universities and published in top journals have anything of importance to tell us about the dilemmas of contemporary economics and politics? Or is it like the glass bead game in Hermann Hesse's novel, Magister Ludi, a kind of intellectual chess? played by an elite of secular priests for their own amusement. Thank you.